So we're going to continue on with our walk down the history of agricultural policy. Just for your reference, if you're watching this video, our reference material for the video is Agricultural Policy in the United States by uh, Novak, Peace, and Sanders. And we're actually going to be using Chapter 7 from their, from their book as our source material for this lecture today. <clears throat> so let's jump right into it. The, the story starts with the Agricultural Act of 1961, and so the way the book is kind of outlined is it points out things that were happening in the various farm bills as they were passed. And the important thing to remember here is that in the 1960s, the cost of storing crops was getting out of hand. What do we mean by that? Well, for decades now, the Commodity Credit Corporation, through their non-recourse marketing loan, now they didn't necessarily call it that, but through their marketing loan program was in essence acting as a buyer of last resort and was propping up the price of grain by buying grain from farmers and putting it into storage indefinitely. Now, obviously, they rotated the stock, right? First in, first out. You can't just let it sit there forever. But moving all that grain around started costing the federal government a lot of money. And as we roll into the 1960s, we begin to understand that if we're going to continue subsidizing agriculture, we're going to have to do it differently because of the cost associated with doing so. Some other things that are of interest that start to pop up in this story of the 1960s is the concept of a direct payment. The idea of instead of propping up the price, just paying the farmer directly. And here's some terminology that I want you to know that's going to pop up later on in the class that you need to understand these concepts. And that's the idea of a coupled payment versus a decoupled payment. A coupled payment means that the payment you get from the federal government, whether it's a direct payment or it's a higher market price due to the CCC propping up the price, in that scenario, the more you produce, the bigger payment you're going to get. And so your payment is tied to the amount you produce in a given year. And then there's the idea of a decoupled payment where the payment is not tied to your production. And typically what is done in those scenarios is they use some historical past production, a concept that we call base. So what we're seeing in the 1960s is the beginning of a movement away from parity and towards the concept of base. Again, following along with the outline of the book, the big story in the 60s is surplus commodities, all the extra stuff we've stockpiled through our CCC program, the Commodity Credit Corporation, and budget exposure. And so what we see happening in the 1962 Farm Bill, the Food and Agricultural Act of 1962, is more acreage diversion programs. Right, farmers are going to be paid to set aside land. And the other thing that's popped up as well, this is the first time we've seen it and it pops up again later, is a concept called payment in kind or PIC. Basically, payment in kind is a tool that you use to get rid of some of these surplus commodities. And instead of paying a farmer with money, right, instead of giving them money for producing crops, you basically pay them in the equivalent amount of grain. So a farmer would get a certificate they could take and then redeem for uh, surplus stockpiles that we had on hand. In essence, you're, you're paying the corn farmer in corn. Now, as has been done in the 50s and the 40s, you see support payments contingent upon participating in acreage diversion. So you have to have some land set aside if you want to qualify for some kind of payments. And we begin to see in the 1960s, we see little hints of this in the 1962 Food and Ag Act of moving from production quotas and allotments to the concept of base acreage. So instead of saying, okay, Mr. or Ms. Farmer, here is the amount of corn you can grow or the amount that we're allowing you to sell at the higher support price, that's your allotment. And we're instead going to say, let's look at your historical production in the past and let's give you a payment based on that historical production. And in this Food Act, uh, Food and Ag Act of 1962, there was a new wheat price support program that looked a whole lot like what we would recognize as a target price with deficiency payment. So think about this as like testing the waters. This was the first time we tried to make the movement from the old style non-recourse marketing loan from the Commodity Credit Corporation, where we're just going to buy up stockpiles and store it indefinitely with the hopes of raising the price to the idea of just let the farmer sell it and we'll cut him a check for the difference. Again, that's a coupled payment, a coupled direct payment. So if you're cutting a check directly to the farmer, that's a direct payment. And in this program, a target price with deficiency payment would be a coupled direct payment. Now, the conservation programs were interesting, and I want you to look at these numbers for a second, and this gets important for some uh, future discussion. 
Conservation set-aside acres were restricted to 20% of historical base or up to 25 acres. What does that mean? That means that a farmer could potentially put 20% of their historical past production into a set-aside. And then they could put additional 30% into a set-aside and get paid with the Payment in Kind program, the PIC program. So it is possible for some farms, especially smaller farms, to divert half their cropland into a set-aside. And I think, what would Malthus think of all this? Malthus, who said we're going to starve, here in the 1960s, we're not starving. Population's been growing steadily, and we've got so much food that we're literally trying to keep farmers from planting on cropland. Now, the Food Ag Act of 1965 saw a couple of things of interest. The first thing is the idea of an advanced payment. So the way most farmers operate is they borrow money on an operating loan at the beginning of the crop year, or they buy their seed and fertilizer on credit from the co-op or from the seed company. They plant their crop, and then when they harvest their crop, they sell the crop, pay off their loans. Well, you hope they pay off their loans. That's If they don't, they've got problems. And the 1965 Food and Ag Act actually had a provision for advanced payments where a farmer could get their support from the government when they planted their crop instead of when they harvested it. I don't really know where that went. I noticed it in Chapter 7 of the book and thought, well, hey, that's interesting. And I just kind of highlighted it because I'd never seen that before. Now, the other thing that's interesting is the notion of an allotment transfer. Now, we haven't fully moved from allotments to base acres. So most farmers are still going to be dealing with this whole allotment concept. And in the Food and Ag Act of 1965, farmers were allowed to transfer their allotments within the county they lived. And here's what's interesting about this is, you know, I'm old enough to have actually lived this history. When I was a kid growing up in a farm, we raised tobacco and it was really common for, you know, you drive down little dirt roads in the country and, you know, every... Every couple of little farmhouses, there would be a tobacco patch behind every about third or fourth one where someone planted a small tobacco patch. And what basically happened is every farm had had an allotment. We, we could legally grow 2,000 pounds of tobacco, and we could sell 2,000 pounds of tobacco. But more importantly, because the allotment was transferable within a county, if I wanted to grow more than 2,000 pounds of tobacco, I could go to a neighbor and say, hey, I'm planting a big tobacco crop. I'm going to grow 4,000. My allotment's 2,000. Your allotment's 2,000. Can I have your allotment? And to which that farmer would say, sure thing. Here's how much you got to pay me for the allotment. So that's so interesting because there ended up being a secondary market where the allotment itself developed economic value and was traded amongst farmers. Now, when I was doing this as a kid in the 1980s, the amount of profit you could make farming the tobacco itself, you know, growing the tobacco, was about what you could sell the allotment for. And so the decision was, was to work hard all summer and grow my tobacco uh, and have some profit from it, or lease my allotment to somebody else for a year and make the same amount of money. And so the people who really wanted to farm big would go around the county and try to find other farmers and who would who would sell them their 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 in essence a license to grow tobacco for the year. Next thing we have here is again in 65 the idea of a target price with deficiency payment starts to pop up again. And a quote from the book, I forget what page it was, a deficiency payment was provided to producers to make up the difference between a set target price and the higher of the CCC loan rate or the market price. So what you've got to remember about this, when we when we drew the policies out on the board and kind of walked through how these policies worked, CCC, non-recourse marketing loan, was happening simultaneously with the target price with deficiency payment. And that's important because, well, these policies get really confusing, so you've got to understand they're kind of going on at the exact same time. And this seems like a great place to wrap it up. So we'll talk about the 1970s in the next video.